of Title IX, Conversation with IC Women in Sports. Tonight, I'm honored and thrilled to welcome five IC alums back to, to talk with us tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Amy Wilson, Lori Black, Rachel Roan, Paige Pellison, and Kendra Bass. We'll begin tonight with our keynote speaker, and then we will follow up with the panel, a Q&A with our panel. Our keynote this evening serves as the NCAA's Managing Director of Inclusion, where she drives inclusive excellence throughout college sports. Amy supports member schools' commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity, and leads the NCAA's efforts to provide resources, education, and support in the core areas of inclusion. Prior to her time at the NCAA, Dr. Amy Wilson was a tenured faculty member at Illinois College and also served as the faculty athletic representative. As a student athlete at Illinois College, she was a member of the softball team and part of the women's basketball team that won a conference championship in 1993. She, has a all, she was a two-time all-conference standout and holds the career record for both assists and assists per game. Wilson graduated from Illinois College with a bachelor's degree in English and later earned a PhD in health and sports studies with a concentration in athletic administration at the University of Iowa. She was inducted into the Illinois College Athletics Hall of Fame in 1999. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Wilson. Good evening, it's wonderful to be with you tonight. Uh, it's been a while since I've been back on the hilltop and it's a very special place for me. So thank you for coming. Raise your hand if you're a student. You're at a combo on a Friday night. Right? I'm just going to call that out. Right? So thank you for being here. Um, I'm not sure I ever was a dedicated enough student to do that on a Friday night. So we're going to try to make this fun and interactive. And I'll talk for about half an hour or so. And then I want to give the stage and share it with my fellow alums as we talk more about women's sports at Illinois College. So I want to thank uh, A.D. Roman for that really nice introduction. Um, I screamed and did a dance when she was named the AD, the first women, female AD at Illinois College. So, that is a softball coach, right? With our winning softball program, so there's that too, right? So I also want to uh, do a huge thank you to Katie Carls in our development office. I'm really glad she's back on the hilltop. What many of you might not know um, wasn't part of this bio, but I was a basketball coach for a while. And Katie is the best uh, student athlete I ever coached. She's an incredible basketball player. So it's great to have her back here and doing great work at Illinois College. So thank you. And it's, it's uh, you know, really good to be here. Um, I wanted to start just by noting it was 1993. There's the team. Um, I had really big hair in the back row in the middle. And I dug out the one of the nets from 93. It's yellow now. And I even have... Um, the jersey, which, you know, this shows you what that meant. And my mom's here. She was my biggest supporter. Mom, I still have those socks that you wash for me, I think, after every game, right? I still even have the, the pair of Nike socks. So, yeah, I had an incredible experience here um, as a student athlete. I also want to note that um, I know we talk a lot about liberal arts education, and somebody made that pitch to you, and maybe you heard that when you chose to come here, maybe you didn't. But in my professional career and in my life, the journey, the way it's changed, the education I got here, and I was an English major, but the emphasis on critical thinking, on reading, writing, all of those skills are what allowed me to do what I do today. And so I just wanted to mention that, that it was, a, it was the best of both worlds. Athletics really helped to develop me. Um, I got to be president of the English Honor Society. I got to work on the school paper. I got to do so many things while I was here. So I'm forever grateful. And that group of women, um, I'll never forget. And some of them aren't here with us anymore today. And I think about that a lot, but they were an incredible group. And um, it's something I'll always remember. So wanted to mention that. I also believe in being grateful and showing gratitude to people who help us get where we are. So after I left Illinois College, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, maybe law school, maybe I wanna teach, I don't know. And so I went and got a master's degree in English and ended up teaching and coaching. That's where I got to have Katie as a student athlete. And I wanna share this story because I think it's a good lesson for students. 
In my mid-20s, as a young coach and a senior woman administrator, I got a chance to sit at a table and to work on gender equity in an athletics department. The athletics director came to me and said, we've never really worked on equity, so we're going to invite you to the table. You'll be the first woman to sit at the table. I sat at the table, and they started asking me questions, and I started realizing I don't know how Title IX works. I don't understand the law, and I'm not sure what advice to give. And I left that room that day feeling like, I failed. I missed my opportunity. Shortly after that time, um, I learned about a woman named Dr. Christine Grant at the University of Iowa, who was the nation's leading expert on Title IX. And so I thought, you know, if I went and studied with her, I would not fail when I was at that table again. All right. So sometimes it's our lowest moments when we think we just can't do it, that it turns your course and it sends you in a different direction. So I did go to Iowa. I left my full-time job. I went to Iowa, I studied with her, and there she is on the left. And then one of her, um, her good friends um, on the uh, right there, Charlotte West, who was an administrator in athletics and a pioneer at Southern Illinois University of Carbondale, the University of Iowa. Those were women who in the late 60s and 70s started opportunities for women in college sports. And I got to learn with them and from them. Christine passed away about a year ago. So it's very heavy on my mind in Title IX's 15th year. Charlotte's still with us, but that's at the NCAA Inclusion Forum, where on Title IX's 45th anniversary, I brought them to the forum to speak. It was the last time they spoke together. So gratitude to those. And then the message there is seek out those that you'd like to emulate, those that you want to learn from, be in their company. It was the best decision, one of the best decisions I ever made. Another one was coming here to Illinois College. So um, I Megan did a great introduction. This is a little bit about what I do. And I and the NCA Board of Governors are the presidents that run the organization. Some of you may have noticed we're about ready to get a new president. Uh, Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, who just stepped down from his second term, will be our new president starting March 1st. So I'm excited. What will that mean for the building that I work in, right? A new president. Um, so we'll see. But regardless of that, the Board of Governors who lead the NCA, the presidents, there's 16 of them or so, have identified inclusion as a core value. What does that mean? That the NCA is saying for all of our student athletes who come into our space, we want them to have an environment where they can reach their potential, where they can live their true lives, where they can be their true selves. We're going to help them um, not just have a good athletic experience, but become better citizens of the world. So my job is working for the 1100 member schools. So in essence, I worked for Illinois College. I still do, right, in terms of athletics, which is kind of cool, right, because it was hard to leave this place. So I wanted to share that, and then that website is a link to all of the things that, that I do. So I wanted to clarify that, the external, because uh, I'm going to make a point here in a second. Um, who knows what that picture is? Yes. That like March Madness. March Madness, yeah. I call it the, the March Madness debacle, actually. Um, in March of 2021, Sabrina Prince, a student athlete at Oregon, um, tweeted out the picture of what the weight room looked like in Indianapolis at the men's final four and what the weight room looked like at, in San Antonio for the women. I got a call at 6 a.m. Um, the, the morning after that had been out. And I'm like, who's calling me at six o'clock in the morning on a Friday? And it was our vice president for women's basketball. Pretty upset, pretty. So my job that I told you about was serving the 1100 schools suddenly became please come to the other building and help with championships. We have a problem, right? So the lesson here is that you never know in, in your, and I, I will note that um, I offered to help five years before when I first got there and they said, we got this, we don't, you know, go work for the schools. So I have spent literally, it's not an exaggeration, hundreds of hours in meetings where we've gone line for line through everything we do for men's and women's sports and we're working on equity in the championships. So it's been a lot of extra work, but it's worthwhile, right? So that opportunity is there. You push the door open. You take advantage of that. And hopefully this isn't just, we'll get March Madness right, but it will all be done better. So we're working on that. And that's something that's a part of my job. But it's amazing what one tweet can do, right? And I would say, um, am I glad it happened? I am, because it shined a spotlight on problems a lot of people didn't know existed. And sometimes it takes something like that for it to happen. So. Sometimes when I, I'm not getting the, the direction I want our building to go, I'll say, that could be a tweet. That might be a tweet every now and then. So that's the last resort, but we have spent a lot of money to try to make that right, and uh, we're doing better. So, so my job's interesting in this 50th year of Title IX. On one hand, we're celebrating the anniversary across all of our schools. 
So at every men's and women's championships, we had pens and shirts, signs, and we had programming about Title IX, and that was awesome. On the other side, we're still working on all these recommendations where we need to do better. So it's an interesting role to be in. So my message about the anniversary is we do need to celebrate. I'll show you some statistics that say, yes, we really do. But there's also work to do. And it's not just in our building, but it's at most colleges too. Because the mes message about what Title IX is, that it's constantly a work in progress. And I know, where's Megan? You know that, right? You're kind of constantly looking at it and seeing, are we, are we creating equity, right, for our athletes? Um, one of the things that um, I've done, and it's a legacy of Dr. Grant, my mentor, is that I did put out a report last June when Title IX turns 50 that has all the data. What do the participation numbers look like? What do the resources look like? What do the leadership numbers look like? So part of my life's work is to make sure that we know where we are because you can't get better if you don't know where we are. And again, this is about the insane membership. And I'll provide a link to that resource in a little bit. All right, so um, it's Friday night and it's combo. So we're gonna do a true false quiz. You're not turning it in. And you can do group or partner work. Does that sound fair? I never gave true false quizzes. Nobody, you know, you really you don't do that, right? So, but we're going to do it tonight because it's Friday. That's a combo, and I'm going to use the um, use the um, true false questions to teach you some key things about Title IX. I think that's an easier way to learn than me lecturing at you on a Friday night. Then I'll say a few words about Title IX's application to athletics. And then at the end of this presentation, I list several action items, ways you can pursue more knowledge, videos you can watch, things you can look at. And I just talked to Megan and I'll work with Katie to make sure the PowerPoint is attached to the combo. So if you have a school project or just interested in this, you can go back and look at those. That sounds all right. I won't read through all those at you. You can look at it later if you'd like. All right, are we ready for the quiz to see how we can do? And I'm going to ask who got five out of five. All right, here we go. All right, the first question, true or false, Title IX signed into law on June 23rd, 1972, focused on equity and sports. False. True or false. Talk to each other, see what you, all right, I'll give you just a second. All right. I was not, I was absolutely straight <laughs> All right. Okay. How many people think true? A few. Okay. How many are false? All right. On this one. Let's go. False. Read the 37 words. No person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving financial assistance. It didn't say anything about sports. Later, that word activity became, all right, that could be about sports. But in the first year and a half of its existence, nobody even brought up sports. In fact, in Congress, when Birch Bay from Indiana presented this to, to Congress and, and, and put the bill in to be considered, Somebody in the audience said, does this mean that, that men get to, or you know, the women will hang out in our locker rooms? Because I'll vote for it if that's the case. That was the only talk about sports. And those who, were, those who wanted this law to pass were told not to lobby for it. And people voted for it because they thought there was no discrimination in higher education. What's really interesting about where this law came from um, is that it came from people who were experiencing, I can't get a job as a faculty member because I'm a woman. There was a professor named Dr. Bernice Sandler at the University of Maryland who kept getting passed over, even though she had students, you know this matters. You got good teaching evaluations, you're doing good service, your scholarship's there, right? You meet with your students, you're helping them learn. Those are the kind of professors you all want, isn't it? And there's a lot of the, some of my former colleagues in this room that do exactly that. She was told, you come on too strong for a woman and we're not gonna hire you. And that was perfectly legal. Just like it was perfectly legal to do this, at the national headquarters in Indianapolis where I work, there is the, um, a, a, a branch of the University of Indiana Law School. I drive by it every day. Okay? I see the law students walking in and out. Before Title IX was passed in 72, it was completely legal to say 500 new law students are going to come in. We'll save 10 spots for women. So it wasn't based on your grades or your, you know, your ability or, or, or you know, your ability for success. 
you know, you're going to be a homemaker and you're probably going to be pregnant for too long and we're not going to let you into our law school. It was legal to do that. So Title IX was a law about access to education. If you have um, a woman in your family prior to Title IX that got a higher ed degree and, and went far and was a CEO or was a doctor or a veterinarian or a scientist or did those things, know that story or find out that story because it was really hard for women to get access to education. Just like it was extremely hard for people of color to get access before our civil rights movement in the 60s and before some of that changed as well. So you got to think about what barriers are there and that's what the law is about. All right. Title IX addresses equity across 10 areas. We know it's education and we know it's sport. That's the law, right? Or not? Is it more? What does Title IX address? It's saying you can't discriminate based on sex and education. 10 areas, what do you think? <laughs> All right, how many people think true? It covers 10 areas. That's a lot, right? How many think false? That's too many. All right, I think the more false is that one's true. All right. It covers 10 areas. It covers 10 areas. What? And actually, so, so we know it covers access to higher education. I just talked about that. That's why the law um, was, was written, right? So that you can't access, you can't discriminate against students based on sex, faculty members, that sort of thing. After a few years after it passed, it became very much a law about athletics. So it's been known about that. How many students in this room, especially if the, those of you who are athletes, um, have re required education about sexual violence prevention? Raise your hand if you go to something about Title IX or sexual violence prevention. Yeah. So in the last decade, out of the Obama administration, that was the emphasis under Title IX. That's Title IX. Many young people I talk today think of Title IX as the sexual harassment law. It's a very, very important part of the law, but it's not all that it does, right? So I wanted to, to show you that, okay? I will share a story too, because you may be looking at some of these and thinking, really? When I was a freshman in high school, um, there was a senior who was in the National Honor Society, really good student, and um, got pregnant as a senior and was kicked out of the National Honor Society and her presidency was taken away. You know what I wish I had known as a 14 or 15 year old freshman? That's a Title IX lawsuit. You cannot, because someone, a student is pregnant, treat them differently, discriminate against them. There, there's a place where Title IX could have worked. Or when I was a high school student athlete and we had to drive three or four miles and play on the church field for softball, well, the guys got a big baseball field and the football field all right there, and we had no fields, we had to drive to all of them. You know, that was a Title IX issue, but I didn't know to say anything. Didn't feel right, but I didn't know say anything, right? So, um, but it actually covers 10 areas, okay? All right, we're moving through. Um, there are more than 10 times the number of girls playing high school sports and women playing college sports today than when Title IX was passed in 72. Have we grown that much, 10 times as many? What do you think? I, I must have some thanks for the number 10. I'm just realizing everything's 10, so I don't know why that is. That's Okay. All right. How many people think true? It has grown like crazy. All right. Lots of truths. I think this was like the easy one, right? And I won't even ask about the falses because it was all. It is true. Okay. All right. This is high school sports participation. And by the way, there was a huge backlash against Title IX in the 70s in athletics. People said if girls and women start getting these opportunities, men's opportunities are going to go down. I just want you to note on the charts that as girls and women's opportunities have risen, so boys and men's, right? We're all kind of growing together. Equity's not a pie with so many pieces. We can find ways to all have a piece if we work together. So when Title IX was passed, there were under 300,000 uh, girls playing high school sports, over 3.4 million. And I know that the National Federation for High Schools hasn't done the numbers uh, since um, after COVID, because of COVID, right? So the numbers are a little dated. So that's progress, right? And, and it's, it's progress if we value physical activity, if we believe that this is a you know, really important part of our educational system. But I want you to notice one thing. I want you to look at the first column and the last column in the, in the chart. So the first green and the last blue. And I want you just to analyze that for a second. And if you notice something you want to share, raise your hand. First green column, last blue column. What is that? What story does that tell? Yes. Yeah. Good. You got that right away. Hand went right up. 
based on these numbers, and maybe when we get them in 23 or 24, we'll get there are still less girls playing high school sports than there are boys in Title IX this past. And when this chart came out, I kept looking at it, I'm thinking, could that really be true almost 50 years after the law? So you always have to ask yourself, is it because girls are less interested in sport or is interest a function of the opportunities we provide, right? So something to think about there. And then when I show you college participation, I want to be very clear, this is only NCAA. There's a junior college system, there's NAIA, we're not the only thing. Okay, so when I say 10 times as many, um, when Title IX was passed, we're about 30,000 women playing college sports. When you add NAIA and the junior college, that number is up over 30,000. That's how the 10, 10 times is true. Okay, just to be clear there. Um, it, it's great, both numbers have gone up, but we still have a gap of you know, double digits, you know, 13% there when female undergraduates make up 55% of on average of the population. All right, so the gaps are closing, more women are playing sports, and we see the numbers moving in a good direction, but we have not, but we're, we're still seeing that there's quite a distance out there. So, all right. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, participation by race, ethnicity, and by our international students. This gives a 20 year um, vision, and in the report I wrote, it's on gender and both race and race ethnicity, which are the two demographics that we, we collect. You'll notice that in the, in the last 20 years or so, our student athletes are becoming more diverse. Part of my job is to watch sports to look at, are those opportunities there? Right now for women of color, particularly black women, we see many of them in track and field and basketball, but we're not seeing them have opportunities in other sports. Why is that? Because they're not good athletes in other sports? It's not, that's not the case, right? There's other things there that we need to be looking at. So another important part of the equation that we're looking at um, is, is, is race ethnicity of our participants. Okay, since Title IX was passed in 1972, the law has been widely supported and has seldom faced challenges. I feel like I set you up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is false. In fact, the place I worked for, and I got the shirt on tonight, was the, was the entity that probably fought Title IX the hardest in the 70s. Why would the NCA fight Title IX? Why would they do that? Because it meant change. What was that? Because it meant change. Yeah, it did. It meant change. And it, and it meant change that meant sharing resources and power. And in, in most situations we can study, when you start talking about sharing resources and power, you'll see somewhat of a backlash. As I mentioned before, there were many who said that'll be the end of men's athletics. There were many who thought that girls and women were not capable of, of, of playing sport this, sports at this level. They have emotional breakdowns and bodies couldn't do it. There were just so many um, false narratives out there. And there was a huge backlash so much that the person leading the NCA at the time, Walter Byers, and we have a whole room named after him. Here's the irony. I've given a number of Title IX talks in the Walter Byers room. And then I get to tell the story that Walter Byers was the one who said, we'll put a million dollars in the war chest and we'll beat Title IX. You know, isn't it interesting how times changed, okay? So he didn't beat Title IX. Um, that didn't happen. Um, but by the end of the 1980s, there was another organization running women's sports. You see the AIAW there, the Association for uh, Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. If I go back to the start of my presentation, did you notice what I was holding in my hand? That's the voting paddle from that organization. These two women were both presidents of that. All women's led sports for a whole decade. That's a whole other lecture. But when you look at the value system they created, the model of sport they created, it's fascinating to look at it. And many of the things the NCAA is finally doing now that are student athlete oriented, they were doing in the 70s, all right? So just to point that out, okay? I wrote my dissertation on that. That's all I can say or I'll never shut up about it. Okay, so if we, um, the message of this slide, the NCAA fought it, they took over women's sports, there was a Supreme Court case that meant that Title IX was lost as it applied to athletics for most of the 80s. In the early 2000s, President Bush appointed a commission to evaluate Title IX, and many thought they would weaken it as it applies to athletics. The story here, the story here is that it's a roller coaster. And the message here is if we're complacent and think, you know, and the great, the great message is this. My niece Lane is here with some of her friends tonight. She's a sophomore here at IC. I can ask Lane. I watched her grow up. There was no sport Lane ever wanted to play that she couldn't. No one ever said to you, right, Lane, you're a girl, you can't play. That's awesome. So we celebrate that, but it doesn't mean we're done, right? It doesn't mean it's over, right? So being complacent can be a problem. 
So it has not been like a light switch. We have the law, it's only as good as it is enforced, okay? Last one, women have made substantial gains in leadership positions in neurothesia athletics since the passage of Title IX. Surely, I mean, participation numbers have gone up. We got a female AD sitting here in the room. True or false on this? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah. So I would say, you know, growth of what? At least 30, 40 percent. Yeah, it's absolutely false. Okay. So when Title IX was passed in the early 1970s, 90 plus percent of women's teams were coached by women, almost all of them. And if there was a women's program, by the way, in 72, they got 0-2% of the budget. It was run by women. Okay. What we've seen over time is that um, as women's athletics have become more popular and there's become more money or access, we've seen more men enter. Let me say this. Some of the very best allies of Title IX are dads of daughters, our uncles of nieces. I could go down the line. So this isn't about keep men out of Title IX. This is about we need those male allies more than ever. But it's also about making sure that our young people have role models with whom they can identify. I see myself in you, right? That I've had a, a role model who has core identities that, that are shared with me. Doesn't mean mentioned coach. They're awesome male coaches. And, I, and I'm you know, very, you know, so that doesn't mean that at all. But what we've seen is that 60, almost 60% now of women's teams are coached by men. And a lot of that surprises a lot of people, okay? Now you might think, well, if Title IX is working and we're all becoming more equitable, is it happening on the women's side, right? I mean, on the men's side where women are coaching men. No, I mean, that, that's pretty stark difference, isn't it, from the two charts? So we're not seeing, in fact, it's professional sports where we're actually seeing more women get opportunities to coach, which is interesting to me. We did have, I believe it was a Division III uh, soccer, University of Chicago, uh, maybe not. Was it Chicago? Um, female head coach win a men's national championship in soccer, which is a big deal. That's a team sport. So we just haven't seen the, the trade over there. And then when you look at athletics directors, this is why we need to, to clap for Megan. Across the country, 24% of athletics directors at NCAA schools are women. 24%. Okay, 50 years after Title IX. And this shows the breakout by race ethnicity. At Division Three, it's the highest. It's around low 30s. Um, at Division One, it's barely over 10%. So it seems like the bigger the school, the more money, the less women we're seeing in those power positions. So we have work to do on the leadership, right? We do, for sure. Okay. All right. So did anybody get five out of five on the quiz? All right. So... I hope that was sort of a painless way to learn some of the things about the law, what it is, and how it works. This slide I use a lot. It's, it's how Title IX applies to athletics on one PowerPoint. Somebody challenged me to get it into one PowerPoint. And one of the rules of teaching is you never put that much information on a PowerPoint slide. It's way too much, it's way too. But I will say this, at Illinois College, you're looking at A and you're looking at C because you do not give scholarships for athletics, okay? You're looking at A and you're looking at C. So when you talk about Title IX and athletics here, you have to comply choosing one of those three prongs for participation. How do you know that you're accommodating the interests of your students? All right, and that's a, that's a work in progress. There are three different ways you can do it. And the last one, the laundry list, is the one that's the hardest. I know Megan will nod her head at me. Because the last one is all of this. And are you providing an equitable experience across all of those items? You want to go back to the picture of the weight room? The NCA got burned bad on that, right? And that's under locker room practice and competitive facilities, right? We got burned on that one. So this isn't easy, right? You have to talk to your coaches a lot. You have to have good policies in place. And let me share just two things about this before I end and we get the panel up here. What a lot of people don't understand about how that works is you look at the entire men's program, the entire women's program, and you say, are you providing equity? Sport by sport helps, but there's no law that says you have to do sport by sport exactly. The other thing, and people don't get this one either, do I have any football players in here? Do I have a football player? Awesome. Okay, can you help me out for a second? If you were gonna go play a game right now, right? 
um, we'll call it a playoff game and we're hosting it here. Let's just make it fun if we're going to do it. How much would it cost for, for AD Roman to outfit you head to toe? Your helmet, your pad, what do you think of the cost? Shoot everything you need to go out and be successful. Helmet is like at least $300 to $400. Uh -huh. Shoulder pads, $250 to $300. Yeah, it's getting Jer good. Jersey, $200. All right, you're at 1000 We keep going, okay? Shoes, the cleats, you're trying to get some nice ones. You gotta get nice ones. She's gonna buy you nice ones. <laughs> <laughs> 100, 100 to 130. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I just did it. I was an English major, not a math major, but I just got up to about 1500 right here. Okay, so thank you. That was a great help. I have a volleyball player in here. I need a fall sport. Awesome. How much does it cost AD Roman to outfit you to go uh, win the conference championship over Bruce? Yeah, you know, I'm not doing all our deep pads. Yeah. You get good shoes. They got good shoes. You get good shoes. Hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Couple hundred, two fifty. You know, we want a nice uniform. Okay. okay. So here's what Title Nine doesn't say. The athletics department just spent fifteen hundred on you. What's your first name? Shooks. Shooks. Yes, ma'am. All right. I'm, I'm Shooks. And what's your name? Or you were talking to Alex. And for Alex, you spent two fifty. Title Nine doesn't say. Go spend another thousand on you. What it says is you've been treated equitably. You have the same quality of uniform, you're ready to play, you're ready, to, you know, you're safe, you represent the college well. That's how the law works. So can you look at budgets and know if you're in Title IX compliance? You can't. Budgets can help. If you look at your men's basketball budget and it's six times the amount of the women's budget, which I may have just been through that in the NCA, then maybe you've got some problems there that need to be fixed, right? But the money doesn't tell you that. And then here's the other one that always gets everybody. I know this is a the development. Um, event has been a combo. Title IX does not care from where the money comes. So AD Roman can't get a $5 million donation for Illinois College football and start flying a football team on charter planes and say, oh, it was a donation, so that's why we're doing it. If the Office for Civil Rights that enforces Title IX comes in, they'll say what matters is how the money Illinois College has, no matter where it came from, is impacting student athletes. Does that mean that AD Roman doesn't take the $5 million? <laughs> ah, she takes it and she's really excited. But, but then you have to say this, how are we going to do this in a way that creates an equitable environment? And think about this, students. Do you do better in an environment where you know the person standing next to you is valued like you are? Everybody rises together. You create a culture where um, you, have, you have equity there and people can rise together, okay? So a lot of folks don't know that if it's boosters or it's fundraising and those sorts of things, yes, bring in the money, but you have to educate those folks to say, my mentor, Dr. Grant, would say you wouldn't build the most fantastic science building ever with all of the latest equipment for all the cutting edge research and then say, we think we'll only let the men use it. They've historically had more success in science and we're just going to let them use it, bristling down here in the front row, okay? So think about that in terms of athletics as well, right? It's part of our educational experience. Okay. So that's how the laundry list is done. It's the hardest part. And then that participation is are you accommodating your interests? Title IX doesn't say create one of those teams when there's no interest. It says, are you accommodating the interests that's there? So you pay attention to that, okay? So what I will say then is that on these last few slides uh, that I'll make sure are connected to the combo piece, I just listed all kinds of cool stuff you could go look at or watch if you like this subject, if you want to learn more about it, if you have a school project related to it. I'll say on this first slide, um, really recommend that paying attention to the Office for Civil Rights and what they're saying about Title IX. Just today, when I was on the car on the way here, they released a new resource on Title IX and athletics. It just came out today. So of all days when I'm coming here to talk to you tonight. And do what you can. One of the best things I ever did was coach my uh, sixth grade um, nep nephew's basketball team. Because a bunch of young boys got to see that a woman could do that. Uh, Lane's older brother, Ty. Remember that, Lane? You were little. But I coached Ty's sixth grade team. Find ways that you shake up the gender norms, right? Find ways that you ask who's getting opportunity and who's not. And then again, these are all just different things you can go and look at to learn more about Title IX, right? So I appreciate you being here on a, on a Friday night. Um, I always say this when I'm talking to a room full of students. If you want more information or want to talk more about any of this, especially if it pertains to something you're working on with one of your classes or an initiative you're doing on campus, email me, all right? I promise I'll get back to you. I do talk to, um, to different classes on campus sometimes. And I just want to say um, it's been a real honor to be here. And now let's hear from our panel and our um, other alums. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Amy. Can you uh, all please join me in giving Amy one more round of applause? Oh. This time we're going to ask our panelists to come take a seat, and Amy, you can join. I will. I'll let you sit for a song on the end. I'll be on the So as they take their seats, I'm going to introduce briefly each of our panelists. So um, as I say your name, if you just want to wave. So first we have Lori Black, class of 1984, who was a 2003 inductee into the Illinois College Hall of Fame. Lori was a four-year starter for the Lady Blues softball team and a three-year starter on the volleyball team. She was also a two-time softball MVP and IC's Doris Hopper Award winner in 1993. So thank you, Lori. Rachel Roan, class of 2007, was a member of the volleyball and track and field team and served as an assistant coach for volleyball and track and field for three years and also as a head volleyball coach for three years. Uh, Rachel and her husband, John, manage and own Venice <laughs> World, Case Street Ball Club, Kitchen 63, The Vault, and the Midwest Athletic Center here in Jacksonville. <laughs> Paige Collison was class of 2014 and was a 2022 inductee into the Illinois College Hall of Fame. She was a four-year letter winner in softball and a three-year letter winner in basketball. She was named first team all-conference for three years in softball and held multiple softball records, including first in career stolen bases, uh, career stolen bases in a season, runs scored, and career triples. She currently holds a record for runs scored in a single game and 38 triples in a season. Uh, uh, I was like, that was a lot of triples. <laughs> <laughs> she had nine triples to clear the record. Thank you for all in all. <laughs> Kendra Bass, our final panelist, was class of 2022. She was a four-year member of the Lady Blues women's basketball team and is currently an assistant coach on the Midwest Conference fourth place conference tournament clinching team. Uh, during her senior season, season, she started every game and averaged 14.9 points per game. She led the team with 38 three-pointers, that's a real stat, made, and was named the second team all-conference. Uh, Kendra is currently a teacher in Winchester. I'm going to start off with a question and then we can open it up to all of you guys to ask the panelists questions, but I'm going to ask each of you just to explain how being a student athlete here at Illinois College has impacted uh, the person that you are today. Who's going first? Oh, I'm on it. All right. Uh, so, um, like Megan said, I was a four year uh, varsity volleyball player, and then I was also a four year track athlete here at Illinois College. Um, I would say, more than anything, being an athlete at Illinois College prepared me for what I stepped into as an entrepreneur. Um, into my early 30s. So yes, I did coach here. Yes, I did do um, a, a lot of other jobs working into the career that I am now. But um, athletics prepared me for any sort of Try not to cuss. Um, <laughs> any sort of hardship that I could have possibly had. So when you're in athletics, especially being a female in athletics, um, you have to encounter things on a daily basis that you're not ready for. Um, whether it's in a practice that you're not ready for, whether it's in some sort of competition, whether it's um, being compared to a male athlete um, at Illinois College back in the early 2000s. Um, there were a lot of hardships that came up daily that you were put on the spot and you were made to have to address things on the spot right off the bat. So I think being an entrepreneur now, I'm able to step into these positions uh, and all the different businesses that I own kind of more with an authoritative figure and also with more confidence because I was an athlete here. Um, I'll you back, yeah, you back on that a little bit. Um, just being an, ath an athletics, you are in a situation, just male or female, that you have to think on your feet, your crunch time, things like that. Um, but I will say uh, I was 
lucky enough to have Amy as a teacher, professor, and advisor. Um, and uh, my position now as a teacher, I'm able to share a lot of information that you know she has shared with us, and it's me as a student um, with my students now as well. It's not necessarily hammering Title IX, but just hey, being aware of comparisons that we make um, from male to female and races and things like that. Um, so being an athlete, like I said, you're lucky enough to get information that you can hopefully share later on as well. Um, I think it prepared me because like freshly out of college, it's like my normal day as a teacher is just like how it was in college. Wake up early and at 6 a.m. do practice and have a full day of classes and come home and rest. And, uh, it also helped me with coaching too because I coached junior high girls basketball. So I used a lot of what we did at IC into my uh girls there as well. So I knew when I came to Illinois College that I wanted to pursue a career in some sort of a sports field because sports had always been a part of my life. So when I came here as a student athlete, um, that whole experience created a uh, career path for me that enabled me to um, work in the, the public information office here at, at Illinois College and then eventually as a sports writer at the Jets Walter career. And I think being an athlete here and having those experiences and getting to know those people uh, helped create that path for me. And uh, it, it was invaluable. I will open it up. I know Amy talked about her experience during her presentation, uh, but I'll open it up to someone <clears throat> from the crowd have questions. Um, being female athletes, what's probably one of the most things that you've struggled with when you were playing in college? Like a struggle you faced or one that was like in your sport? <laughs> so probably uh, one of the struggles I remember, and of course you have to remember, I'm the oldest here. <laughs> so this was a long time ago. So this is probably 1983. And um, this is kind of where we saw a little bit of an inequity here in Illinois College. And it, was, it wasn't just Illinois College, it was across the country. So I'm not trying to point fingers, but um, we were getting new standards in volleyball. So we were getting the new nets. And, the and we were excited about playing in the main gym, Memorial Gymnasium, which of course no longer exists. But for whatever reason, and I'm still unclear to this day whether it was not wanting to drill into the wood floor or if structurally that wood floor couldn't handle it, we had to play in the annex of Memorial Gymnasium. And Diane Reed is one of my teammates is here tonight. And she can remember that she's shaking us out. So we had to play in this very small annex gym. And the, 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 the gym was long enough, but it really wasn't wide enough. It, of course, it accommodated a court, but then right behind the official in the post was the scorer's table. And then right behind the scorer table, we were at least squeezing three rows of bleachers for the Disney crowd. So I remember thinking at that time, you know, this doesn't really seem fair. You know, we're stuck in this little annex gym. But, you know, you had to balance that. But yet at the same time, we were grateful for what we had because it was taking a step forward. So I guess back in the 80s, that was my struggle a little bit. But we saw some of that in equities. But, but again, you had to balance that with being grateful for what you had. And, and, you know, Title IX does, for me, I want to walk away with feelings of gratitude about time and stuff, but it certainly is a work in progress. I'll kind of piggyback off of that because I um, came to Illinois College in 2003, and I was actually the first uh, female sport to compete at Burner Fitness Center. Um, so our volleyball team was the first. We actually had our preseason in Memorial where I literally passed out like on the floor because it was so hot and um, I thought I was going to physically die um, uh, in Memorial. And then our first game um, ever was at Bruner Fitness Center, which at that time was such a huge thing. And it was such a big thing for any athlete. It didn't matter whether you were male or female at that time. But I will say one of my biggest things, and this is back before I under, I, I had no understanding of any Title IX. Um, I was I was so excited to be playing a sport at Illinois College that none of that resonated to me until years later when I was coaching at Illinois College. And now that I'm doing all of these things within Jacksonville with it, when it comes to uh, little kids sports, I was so excited to be 
on that court at Bruner Fitness Center for the first time. It wasn't about being male or female, but nothing was ever shown for female sports. Everything was about being on the football field or the basketball courts for men being set up at Bruner Fitness Center. And I remember seeing all of these pictures and it was actually, it's so funny because my husband today was like the billboard of Bruner Fitness Center. And yeah, he's really, really good looking and he was really muscular. But at the time I was like, where are all the female athletes? Like, where were all of these billboards of these pictures of all of us being a part of Bruner Fitness Center? And none of that was a thing. It was John pole vaulting and it was um, so-and-so doing basketball. And it was somebody holding a football helmet in on our volleyball court. And it was never anything about the fact that we were the first person or group of people to play on this court. And to this day, that's always been something that I'm like, where was that resignation? Like where, you know, like where, where, where did we, where did we go wrong on the fact that it all came back to football, basketball, and men competing in track. And, you know, I, and I still have a picture of John and he's still very good looking in that picture. And it was really, really annoying. <laughs> yeah, but it still burns my butt. And then no, there were no females at that time. <laughs> So I'm going to go off script, and I'm really curious about the, the role that international students play mm -hmm. in NCAA, and in particular, what are opportunities that you see, and, and you can, since this is supposed to be about women sports, you can answer this yeah. in terms of international women, who yeah. do we bring, where are opportunities to um, give international women opportunities in Division three athletics in the US. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. She's asking about international student athletes, and it's an area that was added to my office about three or four years before I got there. So it shows that it hasn't been thought about as long as it should have. Um, a year ago, well, about 14 months ago, we held the first ever international student athlete think tank. And we invited people from all over the country, many who, um, not just in athletics, but in different academic departments that support international student athletes and a lot of international student athletes too, and asked them um, what are opportunities, what are challenges, and we collected a huge, great body of information. We've used those to put out some initial resources um, to guide athletic administrators and international student athletes. But what we're also realizing is the NCA has something called an eligibility center. So what, what we need to do then, and I was gonna say what I learned from playing sports was collaboration and teamwork. My office is now partnering with the eligibility center and some others to say, how do we provide the information much earlier so that the pathway to get there is much clearer, right? It's amazing how many international student athletes show up um, on campus after having visiting the campus. And maybe their first time in the United States when they even come over. So there are a number of challenges and barriers that are there that are not there for other students. The number of international student athletes in our system is growing. It's over 20,000 right now. I will say COVID and certain presidential um, or pres 10 years of certain presidents maybe ha had some negative effect on that just because of access to getting into our country. So we are working on that. And we have a whole now website all about international student athletes. So if you go to the nsa.org slash inclusion, you can see all sorts of things we're doing for international student athletes. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a great opportunity um, because, uh, you know, for the, um, the scholarships, because you can't get student, you can't get other aid for academics or other things. So the athletic scholarship is a pathway. It's a way in. So um, for D3, that's another challenge, right? The money isn't there. So it's looking for other opportunities. So we see different challenges there. It's a great question. Yeah. I was uh, the NCAA Athletic Eligibility Coordinator at Western Illinois University before I retired in 2019. And so I think um, mm -hmm. we were recruiting a lot of international student athletes at the D1 level, a lot of women golfers, uh, soccer, mm -hmm. uh, basketball. Mm -hmm. But I think 9 11 changed that, it did. that landscape. We made the restrictions a little tougher to get in and, and visas and all that. It's really interesting. My automatic assumption would have been sports that they can't play. So I know that we've had, I remember the first international students I talked to just at NIC was a Canadian softball player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just yes. well, you know. um, but then we've also had you know, men coming to play American football and so I'm, I, it's interesting that it's sports that I think of as more international based. And depending on the country, it's easier than others. You know, obviously Canada yeah. or Mexico, it's, it's much easier. Yeah. 
requirements are not stringent, um, but it all depends on the staff. Great, thanks. Good back. <laughs> So Title IX now not only includes sex, but includes gender. So how um, are, do you feel that trans women athletes are being accepted into the community? Um, they're not very well right now no. in, in a lot of our, um, a lot. We, um, it's probably the most divisive issue um, right now related to women's sports. And I say women's sports in particular because it's trans women that people are, are, are up in arms about. So um, what I will say back to our board of governors, I referenced about the core value of inclusion. They have um, stated that we will always provide a pathway to opportunity, that a student athlete can play a sport that aligns with their gender. What we're doing now with our Sports Science Institute so inclusion and the Sports Science Institute are working together. Sometimes the views and the way we think about going forward don't always match up, but we are trying to make sure that any decisions are based on um, you know, the best evidence that we have. So we're trying to balance, um, I guess, what you would call fairness and inclusion, but we have, we have a pathway. We've had a policy for 12 years. Nobody said a word to me about it for you know, the first six years I was there until we had a trans woman be really successful. Mm -hmm. And there are countless numbers of student athletes who use that policy and it's been terrific and great, you know, and nobody said a word. So it's, it's been interesting to see that. So, um, you know, we have a ways to go there and it's kind of a day at a time sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we want students to be able to participate and to be their true selves. And, and that, that's something that, you know, my office is at our inclusion forum that we'll have in April, where it's a whole weekend of everything DEI and in Indianapolis. Um, we will definitely have sessions on that, you know, that talk about how does our policy work and then the inclusion aspect of it as well. What's a little bit scary is the international world and some others are setting testosterone limits that are so narrow and so low. That I'm worried that for a college athlete, by the time you would meet some of those requirements, if we end up going there, you've missed your opportunity to play, right? So um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not only dividing our country in athletics, it's dividing our, our country in terms of healthcare and how we provide that. So um, one of the things I just always say to people, um, it, before you make judgment on this, or before you say, I, this is the way this should be, have you ever met a trans person? Have you ever had a conversation um, you know, with someone and understood their story or their lived experience. It's always my recommendation or to seek that out and with social media, you know, we can find those things. So we are trying to share lived experiences so we humanize this issue. And it's not just about, um, you know, a, a level of a certain chemical in your body or much more than that. So, yeah. And the Biden administration has said sex means gender. And so there's, I just talked to an OCR person today and and they're supposed to be coming out with some guidance. They didn't, they came out with, here's a resource for Title IX and athletics. So it's gonna be really interesting to see what the Office for Civil Rights does in the coming months. And I'm sure elections will play a part in that and, and the general population's view on some of these issues, just to be honest and transparent. So we were intentional about trying to have panelists from uh, different time frames at Illinois College. So I think it would actually be interesting if you guys could share a little bit about what life was like as an athlete during your time. Um, you know, what was a day in the life of a student athlete? <laughs> you <have your> <laughs> well, I guess it depends on the year because sure. my freshman year, we had practice at four. So we oh. had classes and then practice four to six or six oh, to eight. Okay. My oh, sophomore <laughs> through first semester of senior year, we did practice at six to 7.30 in the morning. And so it changed from that to six to 7.30, then I would have class. And then we wouldn't do anything, maybe film after at like 4.35. But my second semester, my senior year, we had to change it from being in the morning to the afternoon because I was a student teacher, so I had to teach from 7.30 to 4 and practice for 6 or 6 to 8. <coughs> How did COVID impact your time? You're the only one who was here for oh. COVID time. Yeah, so my junior year, we like had half a season, I think, not even. So we got a like, mid-year deal with that round. 
senior year it kind of affected it this year because we still had to test a lot and we had to quarantine my the first semester of school like half the team was quarantined and like we couldn't play certain games they had to be rescheduled didn't know if we were going to be able to play games in the conference so that was pretty difficult but as long as you got the shots that like, you could do anything unless you tested positive then you have to go home but you know some people didn't want to get the shots and that's totally fine but their experience was different because i was vaccinated to people that weren't they like barely even got a, a chance to play this year or last year's Kendra, you talked to us a little bit about some of the, you know, additional things. So weight room, oh, yeah. strength coach, oh, yeah. you know, uniforms, you know, yeah. things like that. Um, so rides. with, I don't know when it changed because my freshman year, I remember we would lift either before or after practice, but in junior and senior year, we got to pick our own slots. That's when we got a new strength coach. He just did it throughout the entire day where students from any sport would come out and lift all together. So that would only take about 45 minutes if you did it fast enough. Sometimes it'd take an hour if you were lingering around talking. Um, uniforms, I think we got new uniforms every two years. I think, I'm not sure. I think we get it every two years. Where either we got a new blue jersey or a new white jersey with all oh. change. Uh, we would get it's a lot different. We would get um, um, bags, we would get practice shirts. I think we have three practice shirts, um, practice jerseys, um, socks. socks. We had a minor, we had to give back the bags and stuff, but we had, they gave us uh, socks to get we got to be black and white. Travel, we would get our meals paid for, take a charter bus, we would share with the men. <laughs> um, I played basketball for the first three years and softball for four years. Um, typical day in the life at that time, I think pretty much everything was during that four to six time slot. There was very few, I think baseball would have been the only one that I remember practicing outside of that time slot. So it was just typical get up, go to class, get your meals, and then be prepared at four to do preseason stuff for me in the fall, and then get right for both basketball and softball, um, splitting days, things like that. Um, but I mean, as far as the charter bus for basketball, um, shared it with the men. Um, softball, I think this has changed, but uh, it was all vans, um, yeah. including a nice van trip to uh, Florida oh, here. Um, but and like even for spring break trips prior to a uh, canceled flight was um, buses generally to Myrtle Beach, Florida. We flew my junior year, I believe. Um, so Megan was assistant softball coach my first two years and head coach. And I think a lot of things were changing just just with times and time of time. You're, you know, this was 2011, 2012. Um, but I remember after my third year of basketball and talking to the incoming head coach, uh, I remember specifically she asked about gear that we got. Um, and I was like, oh, we had a new white uniform because when I was here, we were transitioning from navy blue to the uh, true blue. True. Yeah. Um, so our um, white uniforms, home uniforms at times still had like the navy outline, but we had gotten new away ones my first year because they needed to be true blue. Um, but in, it took a little bit of time to change the home ones. Uh, but we really didn't get much in terms of basketball at that time in terms of keeping anything. Um, practice uniform, you returned. Um, and that was one thing talking to the incoming head coach. She was like, well, that's gonna change. And so that was interesting time frame wise. Like she's like, oh, you guys are gonna get more like practice shirts and shorts that are going to be yours to keep and uh, you know, like team socks and things like that, which we never had before. Not that it was like, oh, like we need this, this is wrong. It was just, oh, this is how kind of how it is. Um, we got this stuff, we were getting new stuff. We just necessarily didn't keep it, but that was something that was going to change with the incoming head coach. Um, and as time progressed in softball, like practice jersey, and not practice jerseys, but practice shirts and kind of more team shirts every year. Um, and I think the 
progression of new uniforms probably wasn't every two years, but um, it was so we got new uniforms that I just like once and when we saved some money, we were able to get another uniform too as well. So, so um, again, I was 03 to 07, starting right off in um, Bruner. This was back when we were Navy, we were not true blue. We, and this is, sounds like super dramatic, we had nothing. Like we had two uniforms um, that were passed down. I mean, it was cotton my first year. It was that bad. Um, we had the same uniforms for two years, and then we actually had to do a fundraiser our junior year to uh, get new uniforms for uh, volleyball. For the track team, everybody kind of just wore their own shorts and then had tank tops. Um, they did men's singlets our junior year that were like the best things ever at that time. Um, but the women did not have anything and anything that we did have was a hand me down. Um, I think the number one thing that resonates at that time when it comes to uniforms and like when I see everybody across campus now, I'm like, gosh, everything's so pretty. Like everything's so fun. You know, there weren't bags. There weren't, you brought your own socks, you brought your own shoes, you brought, you bought your own volleyball uh, knee pads. Um, you wore, we didn't even actually get volleyball uniform spandex until our sophomore year. We just bought black spandex and everyone wore their own black spandex. So like seeing the evolution of everything now and going in from being an athlete to coaching, I think it's amazing just because of seeing the progression. But looking back on it now, I'm like, Wow, that sucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was not fun. But then going from being a coach, I also think that that time of being an athlete changed my perception and also changed a lot of the coaches' perceptions. Um, I was very, very fortunate to coach under Mike Brooks, who raised three daughters, and I was basically his second daughter. And um, I worked under him for numerous years as the assistant women's and head women's track coach that I truly believe that he was one of, when you say we need allies, he was one of the allies here at Illinois College in female sports to make sure that these females were taken care of in track and field just as much as the men were, because it wasn't an option before that. And he saw where the struggles were on not just track and field, but any female sport. And he was willing to speak up and talk and make sure that any sport, regardless of what it was, was taken care of. And so then going into being a coach, it was more of us having that voice because we knew what it was like to be an athlete. And then coming into being a coach to be able to speak up and make sure that everyone was taken care of. So I was an athlete here in 1980 to 1984, volleyball and softball. And our day was pretty unremarkable. You know, you get up, go to Baxter, stand in line to get breakfast, go to your classes. We would have practice somewhere, I think it was 3, 3.30, and we'd finish up just in time for dinner. So get to Baxter for dinner. And then, uh, you know, study or go to literary society meetings on Silver Phi Epsilon and then you go to bed and go to bed and do it all over again. Um, we didn't have weightlifting was not part of our training at all. Um, I don't think if there was a weight room even. I'm sure there was the football games, but it was down by the pool. Yeah, I think they were down there. Our uniforms were polyester, yeah. and uh, we, our volleyball uniforms we had to share with the basketball team. So we had to pass them down. Uh, we finally got long sleeve volleyball uniforms, polyester. Uh, yeah, we were thrilled with those. You know, it was finally our own uniform. Um, travel. Um, we ate a lot of McDonald's apple pies. That was our. Travel was. was uh, <laughs> Passenger uh, suburban vans, mm -hmm. uh, and they were pretty rusty, and you were just hoping that you would get your destination and back. <laughs> we had an occasional breakdown, so they'd come and get us. Did anything ever drip from the ceiling? Mm -hmm. We had stuff dripping from the ceiling sometimes. I'm not sure what that was. I guess it was mine. Our season kind of depended on, uh, you know, when I was playing, Coach Debbie Kilby, who unfortunately we lost this past October, um, she was the coach for volleyball, basketball, and softball. 
So our season startup time kind of depended on when she could end one season before we started another. So, you know, we were very minimal in what we had, but at the same time, you know, we, we were grateful for what we had, we enjoyed playing. Um, but um, I do have one uniform that I, piece that I do remember, we did have the tube socks, you know, tube, yeah, socks, yeah. tube socks, and we've got Illinois down the side. Mm -hmm. uh, still have those, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> might, might have a uniform or two, but I might have to sneak off with my, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't, it provided much to us. We did have the travel bags for softball, um, kind of cleaned up bags that we had to return, you know, hey, I, I think uh, we need to pay you back. Me and both, both Paige and I both need to pay you back off of what you said. So even when you were talking about like a strength and conditioning coach, like my like job was just automatically like, oh my God, that's so cool. Because we didn't have that. I mean, we did not, we did not even have the option of being in the weight room from three o'clock in the afternoon until 8 p.m. at night for any female sport from 03 to 07. Because if we were gonna lift, everything was around, and I, I love, love all of you men in here. Like everything was around what the local team was doing at that time. Just so based on sheer numbers of them. Based on and great, great for Illinois College and great for things that were going on. But like there was never an opportunity to have a strength and conditioning coach for females. Like when people ask me what my biggest regret was when it comes to being an athlete in Illinois College, it was a fact that I did not take my strength and conditioning seriously because A, I didn't have the knowledge. B, I had no idea what the opportunities could bring me when it came to being a better athlete. And C, we didn't have the areas to be able to do it. So now when I see all these amazing athletes and I come and watch these games and I, I'm almost in awe and like almost jealous about the fact of like, man, what could I have been? Like I was a great athlete. I was all conference. I threw the javelin in college because there was nobody else on that I was that good. <laughs> but like... There, there was not that strength and conditioning opportunity because still, even in 03 to 07, that was still something like, like the guys go in the gym and lift the weights, not the females. Luckily, my junior year, we had an assistant softball coach who kind of specialized and went to college for that. And he just so happened to also be the men's basketball assistant coach. Another well. ally. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he took both basketball teams and the softball team kind of under his wing and really focused on uh, strength and conditioning aspect of that. But it was because he was, I mean, both sports I played, he was basically an assistant coach for both. Um, that, I mean, I think there was no coincidence that some of my better years were my junior and senior year. Not 38 But they came when I was able to finally have access to it. And it was just by chance. It wasn't. Yeah. Like I said, we were told a lot of times to go to the weight room. And during that time, I think sometimes after softball practice, again, when kind of the one who went to school and was knowledgeable, um, kind of led a lot of that stuff after basketball and softball practices a lot. But to have like that, like, oh, he's the strength against yeah. that was not, that was not. And I should. Yeah, that was not. Yeah. I kind of lucked into it later. <laughs> Well, we are past eight o'clock, but just wanted to leave if there's any, anybody have any follow-up questions or anything for our panelists? <laughs> if not, then I just, you know, thank you guys so much for being here.